Uh, we are here with Steve Wand, aka BitBuzz, uh, a legend in the NFT space. Uh, and Steve, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we appreciate you making the time. Uh, today we want to talk about a few different things. I want to talk about some of the projects that you are currently working on, uh, a little bit of your history in the space, um, and a little bit about your NFT collection and uh, what's exciting you these days. Uh, so maybe just to start people off, for anybody who may not be aware of you, uh, how did you get started in NFTs uh, and maybe crypto in general? What first sparked your, uh, sparked your fire in this space? 100%. And thanks for having me on, David. I appreciate it. No, pleasure. Um, so I actually, I started reading about uh, BTC back in about 2012. Um, didn't fully grasp it the first couple times I read it. I um, had to dig a little bit deeper and then um, spent like a weekend literally like buying some, moving it around, figuring it out fully. Um, and that was a really like an eye opener for me. Um, that moment I was like, wow, this is like the, the craziest technology I've ever seen in my life. Um, so that led me kind of uh, pretty heavily um, down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, and then I found out about Ethereum in 2014 from Ethan Bachman, uh, who is now the kind of one of the top people at Cosmos, um, Adam uh, Token. And Ethan was the one who said that uh, you should take a look at this Ethereum thing. They're ICOing soon, and it's, uh, it's doing smart contracts. You know, kind of different from what BTC is doing. Um, so I did take a serious look at it, and I was like, wow, this is pretty impressive. Uh, being kind of native to Toronto myself, um, there's a lot of people that were around the area that also were talking about Ethereum. So it was a no brainer to get involved in it at that time. And then I kept following Ethereum, um, saw some you know unique things happening with, with different implementations and they had Homestead and uh, the, the six versions they were implementing over the two years to get it launched live. Um, and then I was at Ethereum Waterloo, which I believe took place in November of 2017. And actually I was in the second row right behind Vitalik and his father, Dimitri, um, when at the Shopify building. Um, in Waterloo that they hosted it at, and, uh, and Crypto Kitties had won the hackathon there, at Dapper Labs, and uh, and then shortly after that, I was reading, you know, it was kind of crashing Ethereum. One of them went for one hundred sixty thousand. So I was like, wow, there's something going on here. And I had watched kind of from afar Counterparty on Bitcoin in say 2015, 16, start doing rare Pepe's and spells of Genesis, and uh, so I could see that there was like actual collectibles being tokenized um, on the blockchain, but no one was talking about it. No one owned them that I knew. Uh, any technical questions you ask most people, they have no idea how to answer them. Um, so yes, there were assets, but moving them, storing them, wallets, um, and everything else, like there was none of them, unless like some guy made it, and you had to trust the guy for those assets to be stored properly, um, which wasn't a very smart thing to do at that time. Um, so it was just nice to see like a smart contract platform specifically designed to handle these things came out. Um, and when I saw CryptoKitties, it's like, okay, well, you can breed these things. That's, that's a huge game changer. Um, you know, meaning they have parameters on the back end for future gaming, perhaps. Um, so it was just a no brainer to get involved in it. And so I started, you know, getting some early assets, buying um, a lot of the early NFTs because I was buying the physical art at crypto conferences I was attending. And so when those artists started releasing NFTs, I was all over them immediately. And that kind of led me in 2018, um, maybe mid 2018, um, I realized um, decentrally on a crypto voxels, I kind of found them. And then I was like, wow, what, what is this? Um, and then from there, that kind of piqued my interest. And now I'm specifically um, heavily involved in the metaverse, um, digital fashion. Um, we've launched some wearables on Decentraland about a year and a half ago. We were one of the first companies um, to, to get, you know, the first five to get a license to make wearables in DCL. And uh, and then Somnium Space is a big play for me as well. Um, I see a lot of value in the VR aspect and the high quality gaming. Um, and then with game credits, um, I also see with owning your own assets. Um, we see what's happening with Axie and every, everything else. So obviously, if you give people who are playing Fortnite um, the other model, where they could do the exact same thing, the exact same quality of content, only they can mint their own you know, NFTs, they can put them in game, they can game control game. them, sell them, buy them at any time. Uh, that's a huge game changer. Um, so I've just tried to put myself in the space when I see some value in something that I've been waiting for for a long time. I'm going to be like, here it finally is, it's, it's coming to fruition and, and it is actually live um, or something's going to go live. Um, I try to be there as soon as I possibly can once I've discovered it and learned about it um, so I don't get wrecked or burned by, by entering naively. Um, and I think that's very important too because um, if I would have, um, I think my, my career and my path in the space would have been a lot different had I come in and just like a wrecking ball and just book, grab things, follow the hype and FOMO and just kind of, you know, never was paying attention to what was going on, just following everyone else. Um, I think uh, I would be in a different position in the, in the space. Absolutely. 
No, and it's, it's, you have an incredible history in this space, and I appreciate you sharing all that with us. Um, so many things I want to touch on, uh, and I'm sure we're going to talk about a bunch of them today. Um, but yeah, I think in in kind of summing up one's past in this space, and I know it's such recent history. Every time you're talking about this as history, it almost sounds ironic because you know we're talking about the past few years. But it's, it's, the space moves so quickly that it really does feel like uh, such an expansive list of things. Like, so much has happened in such a short period of time, and that really speaks to you know the the exponential growth of this like hyper modern period that we find ourselves in uh, with Web three and everything that encapsulates it. Um, a few things I want to talk about, um, but just as we're kind of talking, uh, discussing your playbook, how, how things have worked for you in the space, and that's a term that I use a lot in this, uh, in these kinds of interviews, like when I was talking with uh, Whale Shark, we're thinking about like, what were, what were those key steps like in your journey? And I know you were, you were on the NFT train like so early on, and I do, I would actually love to talk about some of the specifics around like Waterloo and people who may not know internationally how, how important of a city that is for tech in Canada and internationally. Uh, but before we get into that, um, being somebody who was into NFTs, and you said 2018, and I know you were at least in crypto earlier, um, what would you say is the first NFT you ever bought? Uh, and was it even called an NFT, or would you just call it crypto art because it wasn't an NFT yet? There wasn't a smart contract yet. Yeah, to be to be honest, the counterparty in Rare Pepe's, um, which is between 2014 and 16, and Ethereum did their own Rare Pepe's late 16, um, those were never referred to as an NFT, a non fungible token, or anything like that. Um, there was Bitcoin um, that people would have at conferences back in the day, and you get like like, like almost like um, like a board. You'd buy these packs, and in those they had parameters, so they were like a Magic the Gathering, only like a rare Pepe style. Um, so when we were doing that, we were just trading. They were literally just like crypto collectibles. That's what we were calling them. Um, and the reason why we called them crypto art is because technically, when you went to the conferences, no one would let you buy anything in fiat. Everyone's like, I don't want that garbage. I just want I want to be paid in Bitcoin. Um, and the, the, the funny part was some of the artists were doing Ethereum work, but back in the day at the conferences, they were still the maximalists. Like it was pretty heavily. Back still then. Are, like, they still are. They still are. They're so active. <laughs> oh, well, totally. And, and in some of those things, like you'd, you'd, you'd find people, the artists would be like, oh, this is cool. You buy one of the BTC themed works and you'd say like, okay, do you have any E-stuff? like, yeah, but it's like in the car or like under the table. It's back in the hotel room. Like, well, why don't you have it here? And they're like, yeah, they're like, you know what? Some people would like knock me for having that here. And I was like, well, fuck that. I want to see it. Um, and so they would show me and a lot of times I would buy them. Um, and then it was Josie typically. So I was buying like crypto kitties. I bought some crypto motors, cars. When I did you buy your like, first uh, uh, crypto kitty out of curiosity? Um, well, I have some, I have quite a few gen zeros and gen ones. So they were like brand new. They would have been in like 2017 yeah. um, when I bought those. And then my daughter bought like 50 of them one day too and was breeding them. Um, and they sit in her wallet now. <laughs> she doesn't awesome. even know she has it. I don't think anymore. <laughs> uh, but uh, but yeah, there was there was um, chain breakers um, was out before, and that's actually that project has sold and gone away. Um, Ox Universe, I brought some planets. Um, that project collapsed and, and is no longer. Um, so some of the early things just were too early, and Counterparty was just too early. Colored Coins, um, just to give some context, this Vitalik was working on a project called Colored Coins prior to Ethereum's white paper being put out in 14. So this was in 2013. Um, and it, it, it literally lays out it's for digital collectibles. Um, that's what colored coins, that's what it's like end goal was to be, um, is to hold these assets we're seeing flourishing on Ethereum. Um, so Vitalik knew that that was a piece of what this would become. I believe back then, um, Counterparty was just too early. And to, to be honest, next, next token um, was not only the first to have an NFT on it in 2014 for the museum in New York, you were given an NFT and that was the first one. Um, but next also moved to proof of stake <laughs> three years before anyone else considered doing it. Um, so it, it was an early blockchain and next kind of didn't win either because it was too early as well. Ethereum came out, was big enough, was almost a standard, had like hundreds of thousands of devs working on it. The first major smart contract platform to be proven. And uh, and so, you know, it was just kind of a no brainer to fall in ETH to lead into the metaverse, into um, the NFTs. Uh, but Josie really, for art specifically, when I bought Josie's stuff at Consensus um, in 2018 or 19, um, she said to me, I'm going to give you a COA today for this art, uh, but in about six months, I'm going to have an NFT ready. And I was like, oh, that's fantastic. And she's like, yeah, you're going to get them free. It's the COA for my physical pieces. Um, and the first two pieces I bought, you got free Josie NFTs with those as a COA. Um, and, and I mean, now those are worth probably hundreds of thousands. Um, and she gave them to us free. And the second time, she sold them uh, when we, when you had to buy it and you could try and match. If you owned a piece, she would reserve it. If you didn't care about the NFT, she would put it on the open market. Um, and I remember they were 0 0.3 ETH and ETH was maybe 150 bucks. So they were still extremely reasonably priced. Um, so 
I do give Josie a lot of accolades and over the years on Clubhouse, on Twitter and a lot of other places, I do give her a lot of credit. Um, she was a very young, um, like very skilled artist coming into a sea of big headed, um, deep pocketed men, um, which is an easy task for a young woman to do who's like not proven herself yet. Um, and she came in with no holds barred, um, was very, very polite about it, but also could stand her ground and be aggressive when need be, um, which you have to give her credit for. Um, and I think after all of these, like now X copy, um, Coldy and Josie and everyone's seeing their day in the light now, um, because they were doing this shit like 2015, 16, when no one was doing it at all. Um, so for them to come out and set the tone with the Coldy standard with the 24 hours and 24 hour auction times, um, all these things were like, I know they stepped up and took the lead on it. And, and I know history should look kindly on them and their work should reflect those price points uh, because they were like the earliest of the early in this space. Absolutely. And I mean, that's really why I want to have, like before we get into a bunch of details, I really do want to have a bit of that conversation with you because I feel like more people need to know about these early days of crypto and, and crypto art and what that even means and what that meant before there were NFTs. Uh, I've had a couple conversations with Rob Ness, uh, both publicly and privately, about you know where he was within this like rare, rare Pepe uh, ecosystem and those relics that he has. Like, I, they're still, you know, people really don't know what to do with them, but I really do believe in the next five years, like those are going to be the things we have in museums uh, explaining the rise in this space because that's well, incredibly it, it, valuable. Like, <laughs> it, and in my mind, even with like the punk selling out now, um, and, and for anyone who knows me, I'm just, I'm not a punk holder. Um, I, I saw them when they were free, didn't get them, um, don't have a desire to have them. I just, I don't like pixelated, um, like low quality um, NFTs personally. Um, so you can see though, there's a huge demand for them now. However, Christie's put out an auction, or Sotheby's put out a, a, um, an article um, that said, you know, we're selling the first NFTs ever. So there's a huge misconception in uh, the space. A lot, a lot of newbies think punks and the reason why everyone, their value that they've, you know, kind of accumulated over the years and the floor they've set is because of their the first NFT. Um, that's a blatant, yeah. um, like this truth, they're like the seventh or eighth project. They're, we're finding about more and more they're, every day. We can say the first um, so viral NFT project, but I hate when people say the first NFT because that's yeah, they are by no means the first NFT yeah. project. And right yeah. now, because they weren't they weren't ever um, obtainable, or, and no one wanted them in demand until they were wrapped because of the standard. They they couldn't be traded easily on OpenSea. The second that you've got rare Pepe spells of Genesis, um, I think it's like token. Um, that other like the, the, the game they had on uh, counter party mm -hmm. when those assets can be moved freely and wrapped with wrap btc traded on open sea in metamask wallets or whatever else where we all use and what um then those are the true holy grails of this space um and i think the the people now grabbing punks are the new DeFi whales that don't know and weren't around to see those things take take fruition so they just grab punks because they just figured and were told that those are the first Right. Um, these other assets are so much rarer and so much more valuable. Like the Spells of Genesis um, Satoshi card, there's 30 of those in the world. That's yeah. to me the homeless wagon Rob card. Rob Ness has one. I was like, holy shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. totally. And, and I mean, some of those Homer Pepe's um, and, and like uh, Token Angels, um, when he bought um, the, the the one from uh, from Matt Cain, when Matt, right. like all those, like people are passing those up right now and spending like $7 million on a, on a punk when you could probably go by like 50 um, you know, rare Pepe's that, that I think in 10 years are going to be far, yeah. you know, outweigh in, in value and just scarcity. Um, and if we are playing the game of like, what's the first, what's the rarest, um, all those are, are 10 times rarer than the punks. There's 10,000 punks. There's, there's not 10,000 of any rare Pepe's. Amen. Amen. I think that's really important to talk about. And I think that these kinds of conversations need to be had more outside of people like the crash course, people like the quick introduction, but the more people look into NFTs, the more people learn about NFTs, um, you have to go back. And when you realize how far back you can go, that's when you, you know, learn more. Um, so you're talking about counterparty, you're talking about some of these early platforms. Another thing that I think is interesting, which is a little bit of FUD as well, is um, Super Rare and Maker's Place. I believe they, they call themselves the first marketplaces. What do you think about that? And I still want to talk about the water the thing, but I just that just got me thinking. What do you think about that? And to you, what is the first NFT marketplace, or how would you even define that as like one of the first ones uh, from your experience? Um, so, so there definitely was art markets prior to that. Some of them don't exist any longer. They are, again were too early. Um, as is like async art, it was too early. It's going to see its its, its light um, in the future when people realize what they can do with it. And async was there the whole time waiting for them just to come with their knowledge and skills. Um, they're great. Async they're so lovely themselves. to work with too. I've oh, talked to them. Async yeah. is fantastic. Yeah. Um, and they're so undervalued. 
they're so under talked about um, and they're so underutilized. Once artists realize what they can do on async, async will will be like a super rare as well, easily. Um, and so will mint base. Mint base is fantastic and it's a sleeping giant in my mind. Uh, but super rare was the first to kind of got like whale shark token angels basilius like myself pablo we all started going on there and and you you just see we we're opening each other constantly um so it was the first one where there was a social aspect where you talk on twitter and then go outbid each other on super rare that wasn't happening on other platforms prior to that because it wasn't enough for us there was like four people doing it um so now there was like 50 of us all doing it and we all got to know each other because just organically because we were outbidding each other and we were buying each other's work um, and you'd be like, oh, you you open me on that? That's a, such a beautiful piece. Like, congratulations on winning it. Um, where it's, you know, now it's like totally different. It's, it's a lot more diluted. Um, excuse me, I was back to no, fine. Um, but as far as, far as open C, when I saw, just because I've been on eBay for like 20 plus years at least, um, I when I saw open C, I was like, this is the exact, I've been telling my wife for 10 years, someone is going to eventually make something that, that like dwarfs open C and makes them look archaic. Um, when I saw open C, I was like, oh my good God, I found it. Right. Um, now, there wasn't the ability to put um, physical on there, but I believe not OpenSea, but other entities will soon be launching an OpenSea uh, and crossing over with eBay where you can do digital and physical items. It, it has to be done. Um, I know a few people who are actively working on it for months now. Um, so that's that's only a matter of time before that, that comes to fruition. Um, and then uh, not like OpenSea is going to lose out because we see OpenSea, the amount of wallets being opened, the amount of user, daily user activity is disgusting. Um, it's growing <laughs> literally. Um, you know what I mean? Like if that if that continues, like that's mass adopted very very quickly. The chasm's totally been crossed already. Um, so in in this in this space, I would give OpenSea, like I always said to, to like business partners, like OpenSea is the new Amazon. Um, it'll be like a trillion dollar company very easily. Um, now, the I'm just I don't know if you look at my Twitter and socials. I'm just um, this space was functioning fine with a hundred of us trying to do it. Now there's ten thousand of us trying to do it. Um, and a whole bunch of VCs knocking on the door and like with their pocketbooks open. Um, I don't believe we, we need them. Um, things will get fast tracked with their money and paying devs, but it also skews at their end goal. And if you're outvoted um, and out and ousted of a company, it doesn't matter anymore. You have no say at all. Um, so as much as it's nice to get VC money, the Mark Cubans of the world coming in, I believe OpenSea is going to start KYCing. Um, if they do an airdrop, you know what I mean? Definitely they'll KYC. Um, so yeah. it will. I don't know it'll taint the space, and if you're truly into the space for decentralization, as and why I got here fully, um, then things like that turn me off. Um, no offense to Nifty, they've done a fantastic job bringing a lot of eyes in the space and blowing up a lot of careers. Um, the second Nifty asked me for my ID, um, I won't be using Nifty moving forward. Um, I removed all my for sale items and moved them all off of Nifty. Um, wow. Like I'm in this space, so I don't have to abide by those things. Um, and point. if you're going yeah. to come, come come full circle. And mandate that we're doing the same thing as, as you know, TD Ameritrade would make me do. Um, you're in that sense, like I know that's when it stops being a crypto company in my mind. Absolutely. 